All right, good evening. Hello to everyone here and all of the people watching at home, which there's quite a few. Uh, my name is Mallory Howard. I'm the assistant curator here at the Mark Twain House and Museum. Uh, thank you for joining us for our Trouble Begins lecture series. And so I'm going to introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, Will McIntosh is a cultural and social historian of the 19th century United States with particular interest in the history of leisure, the history of crime, and the cultural history of capitalism. He is the author of Selling the Sites, The Invention of the Tourist in American Culture, and editor of the Panorama Extensive Views from the Journal of the Early Republic. He is currently working on a new project dealing with the Loomis Gang, a group of horse thieves in 19th century New York. McIntosh is an associate professor of history at the University of Mary Washington in Virginia. He was also a consultant for the exhibition that we currently have up at the museum here called For Business or Pleasure, Sam Summer Sojourns. And so before I welcome Will to the stage, I also just wanna thank our sponsors for the Trouble Begins series, Connecticut Humanities and the Center for Mark Twain Studies, Elmira, New York. Uh, and so please welcome Will to the stage. Uh, and after he finishes, we'll be taking Q and A. So Will, hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Mallory. Um, it's lovely to see you guys in the room and all of you who are out there um, in cyberspace watching. I want to say hi to you as well. Um, and tonight, in the, in the spirit of what I think of as the spirit of Mark Twain, um, I, one of the things I think that, that we love about Mark Twain and why we still um, are so interested in him right, is, is that he spent a lot of time I think analyzing and pulling apart, studying the stories that Americans tell themselves about themselves to in order to reveal a deeper truths of, of American culture, right? He liked to, I think he particularly liked to puncture the kind of comfortable myths that American elites told themselves, um, you know, as, as a brilliant satirist, right? Um, and so in the spirit of Mark Twain today, um, I wanna engage with one set of stories uh, that cultural elites and, and um, leisure marketers uh, told uh, themselves in the 19th century to reveal, I think, something deeper about uh, the nature of American culture um, in the 19th century. Um, I want to begin today um, by telling a story. Um, in the summer of 1767, uh, William Johnson, an Anglo-Irish settler in upstate New York, who had earned a, a baronetcy um, as the British Empire's most important diplomatic link to the Iroquois Confederacy, um, was suffering from a pain uh, from a bullet that had lodged in his thigh uh, during the Battle of Lake George a dozen years earlier. Uh, the Mohawks, which was a Haudenosaunee nation with whom Johnson had close personal ties, and I'm quoting here, determined in solemn council to reveal to their beloved brother the peculiar medicinal properties of the High Rock Spring Johnson was too feeble to travel, so the Mohawks carried him on a litter through the forest to the spot where the mineral spring emerged from a large boulder. Johnson descended from the litter, and for the moment, his manly form, wrapped in his scarlet blanket bordered with gold lace, stood towering and erect above the waving plumes of his Mohawk braves. He then proceeded to make an offering of tobacco to the Manitou of the spring, and then, amid the profound silence of his warriors, he, for the first time, touched his lips to the water and entered the rude bark lodge, which, with prudent forethought, his braves had erected for his comfort, um, directly where the bottling house now stands. And in this primitive hotel reclined the first white man that had ever visited this spring. Uh, according to this story, Johnson remained and drank the waters for four days. When feeling restored, he turned home. Uh, this moment in 1767 was invested with great importance in this story. The popular popularity of Saratoga Springs as a watering place may be said to date from this visit. Um, in case you can't tell from the incredibly overwrought language, um, this story comes from an 1875 volume of popular history entitled Reminiscences of Saratoga and Boston uh, by a local lawyer named William Leet Stone. Um, the only problem with the story, it's almost certainly not true. Right? Um, we do know that Johnson was ailing in 1767, um, but he had made a visit to the Lebanon Springs on the Massachusetts border, 
um, according to his diary, to make trial of the efficacy of the lately discovered springs. Um, not only did he not visit Saratoga, he made no mention of Mohawk guides or porters in his, in his diaries, and he made no claim to being the first white man at the spring. Um, and also, it didn't really fix him. Right? He went home and said that he didn't actually feel any better from drinking the water. Right? Um, the most charitable reading, I think, of this 19th century story that I just told um, is that it was um, some sort of like uh, confused mishmash of different moments in William Johnson's life, treated with a very liberal dose of imaginative detail about waving plumes and whatnot. Um, more realistically, I think it was probably completely invented, um, but not only by Stone, right? By the time Stone wrote in 1875, American readers had long imagined that spa towns like Saratoga Springs had Indian origins, right? Um, these stories all kind of have the same basic components, um, and you see them all over American culture in the 19th century. Um, there's a mineral spring in a deep forest whose water had some sort of almost miraculous health-giving properties. An Indian or Indians who knew about the spring or discovered it through their mastery of woodcraft. And then there's a moment when those Indians showed the spring to an Anglo-American pioneer, thus creating the so-called first white man who drank from it. And finally, the transformation of this wilderness spring into a popular and bustling resort for health seekers and fashionable travelers. These stories appeared in popular histories um, and even in fiction. Right? They, they were ubiquitous and I think fundamentally similar um, sets of origin stories for American spa towns. Right? So my question for tonight right, is why? Why do we see these stories all over American culture that tell these stories about Indian origins for American leisure spaces if they were made up? In the spirit of Twain, I, I want to ask tonight what's at stake in the telling of these stories and what can they tell us about 19th century American culture? But before I get to that, I want to take a moment um, to just dig a little bit deeper into the colonial history, um, the colonial origins of uh, mineral springs towns um, in North America, and the, the origins both indigenous and English. Right? First, as we saw in Johnson's diaries, which I quoted from a second ago, right, um, there's probably a grain of truth to the idea that Indians knew about mineral springs and found them medicinally valuable. Right? Johnson, um, we know, had a deep and long-standing personal and political relationship with the Mohawks, which means that it's entirely plausible that they were his source of information about these mineral springs um, in, in what was Mohawk country. Um, and we know that the Haudenosaunee, um, as well as the Abenaki and the Mohican, uh, other indigenous groups across New England and New York, um, knew about the springs at what's now Saratoga, right? Um, the Haudenosaunee um, called it Kaya de Roseras, and the Abenaki called it Nebizanzbik, right? Um, but they, and they used these springs as, as a healing place and as a kind of place of peace. Archaeological evidence suggests that indigenous people had used the waters long before European colonization, right? So, you know, stripped of its theatrical cliches, Stone's claim that an important cross-cultural mediator like Johnson could serve as a conduit for transfer of native knowledge about mineral springs into Anglo-American discourse is, is totally plausible. However, the problem is that Johnson's Anglo-American contemporaries in the 18th and especially in the 17th century um, acknowledged no such thing, right? If you go back to the 17th century, to the 1600, colonists were generally deeply suspicious of both drinking and bathing in water. This is um, characteristic of early modern European culture more broadly, right? They were not big into bathing, right? Um, so we get reports like um, in 1656 when Adrian van der Donk, who's a, who's a Dutch colonist in the Hudson Valley, says, uh, responds to native reports of the springs as, quote, having special powers and qualities. Uh, but he declared, whether this is exactly as the Indians tell us, I'm not sure. He's disinterested right, in what the Mohicans are telling him in, in 1656. Um, by the 18th century, right, Europeans, both um, in Europe and in North America, right, were more open to the idea that, that uh, drinking water could have health-giving properties. Right? Um, and they became, became more open to the idea that American, the American landscape could have springs similar to those in Europe that, that might have these uh, medicinal, uh, medicinal properties. Right? But, um, uh, as a historian named Vaughn Scribner has argued, it's only through British science and commercial improvement that colonists could truly reappropriate mineral waters from the savage grass of the Native Americans, right? So if you look at what 18th century colonists are saying, they do acknowledge that the water exists, right? But they, they work to erase 
indigenous knowledge about the water um, and to, to supplant that with a sort of European uh, scientific knowledge. And you see this in early American watering places. Beginning in the 1760s, elite colonists um, up and down the East Coast began to gather it at mineral springs uh, in the summers for, for health and recreation. Um, but when they did so, they explicitly described those spaces as, Im as imitators of European examples, usually bath. And in fact, they often named them bath, right? So um, uh, elite Virginians gathered um, at what's now Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, which at the time was called bath. Right, the village of Bath, Virginia, um, in the upper Potomac Valley, so this is the early 1760s. Um, elite Philadelphians gathered at Bristol Springs, which is in, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, and the, the Bristol Springs got established in the 1760s because their earliest promoter could claim experience to having worked in the baths in Bath, England. Right? Um, uh, New Englanders gathered at Stafford Springs, Connecticut, um, which one early visitor directly called the New England bath where the sick and rich resort to prolong life and to acquire the polite accomplishments. So you can see in sort of the colonial era, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, Anglo-American colonists are beginning to, to seek out medicinal springs, but they are very much framing them as replicas of European examples on the American landscape. Um, so if there are moments of cross-cultural knowledge transfer from indigenous people to Anglo-American colonists in the 18th century, like the one that we might imagine happening with William Johnson and the Mohawks, um, they are being buried very deeply um, in the imaginations of Anglo-Americans. Those moments are being erased in the 18th century right up until the moment of the American Revolution, when there is an incredibly sharp turn. A, a turn this sharp, in my experience, is really unusual in cultural history. When you're tracing you know, changing narratives over time, you very rarely get sharp breaks. <laughs> what you are more often likely to get right, is kind of slow, creaking, gradual, contested, messy change over time. But one of the things that I find is so fascinating about this, this particular topic is that there's an incredibly sharp break right at the moment of the American Revolution, where um, early, American, uh, early national Americans basically immediately stop describing mineral springs as being replicas of European examples and almost immediately begin talking about them as indigenous phenomena that had been absorbed by Anglo-American colonists. Um, the first new post-revolutionary uh, destination um, is at, um, I'm sorry, this was, uh, this was uh, the colonial ones. I forgot to change the slide for you before. Um, but as you can see um, up there, Stafford Springs, Connecticut, in the middle there, let's see. In the middle there um, is uh, uh, Bristol Springs in Pennsylvania. And then the lower left there, um, you see that that is uh, Bath, Virginia. Right, it was what's now Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. Um, the first new post-revolutionary destination, like I said, was Boston Spa, New York. Um, and I don't think my laser pointer is, is actually working at the moment. But um, you can see the two, um, the, the two points that are quite closely clustered there on the eastern border of New York State. Um, Boston Spa is one of those. Um, it's a, a, there's a building boom in 1793 that Trans, uh, that changes what is, at that point, a really remote uh, valley um, in upstate New York um, into a, a nascent mineral springs destination. It's being driven by a, a New York merchant and land speculator by the name of Nicholas Lowe. Um, and right away, you can see um, stories to being told about Boston um, and its Indian origins. In 1796, uh, Jedediah Morse's American Universal Geography, which is the first explicitly American geography textbook, um, declares, in tracing the history of these medicinal springs, I could only learn that an Indian chief discovered them to a sick French officer in the early part of the, their wars with the English. So you can see it's vague in the 1790s. It's not nearly as elaborate of a story as you would see um, by, the, by the 1870s, but, but the, the germ of that idea is there, right? That this is um, indigenous knowledge transferred to Europeans rather than a transplanted European phenomenon that has been rooted onto American soil. Um, in the years after the War of 1812, uh, Boston Spa's uh, 
preeminence, it was eclipsed by Saratoga Springs, right, which we talked about a moment ago in the context of William Jordan, which is the other um, pin that is quite closely clustered there on the eastern border of New York State. They're very, they're only about a dozen miles apart from each other, right? Um, and right from the beginning um, of its development um, in the years after the War of 1812, um, uh, its origins were narratively located in that moment in 1767 when William Johnson visited with the Mohawk. Um, so for example, uh, an early um, scientific analysis of Saratoga's waters uh, by a doctor named John Steele reported that by the tradition of the Indians, it appears that they were well acquainted with the High Rock Springs medicinal qualities long before the country was explored by Europeans. The first communication by the Indians was made to Sir William Johnson. They advised him to use the water of this fountain. And in the year 1767, he was persuaded to take the journey. Right? Um, his guides conveyed him to the spring where they remained for some time, removed, improved in health, and afterwards published the valuable qualities of the water. So we don't have those waving plumes and, and sacrifices of tobacco to the Manitou and all those sorts of um, <laughs> narrative incrustations that showed up um, uh, a little bit later. But you can see that the core of that story is already there um, at the turn uh, of the, of the uh, 19th century. The, um, uh, this is a picture of uh, Boston Spa, right, a little bit later um, to give you a sense. Um, I think you can see the emerging power of this Indian origin stories and really the abruptness of that transition that I was talking about a moment ago um, with the expeditious way that early national historians reimagined the history of the colonial era watering places that I talked about a moment ago, right, uh, as having native rather than English origins for themselves. Um, Stafford Springs, right, which I said a moment ago, um, in the late colonial period, New Englanders are, are proudly describing it as the New England bath, right? Um, in a 1797 history of Connecticut, um, uh, writes that the Indian natives made the first discovery of these mineral waters to the English inhabitants and recommended them as beneficial in various complaints. For a number of years after the settlement of the town commenced, they annually resorted to the springs, drank the water, and bathed into them. They represented to the English that the waters made them feel lively. So Stafford Springs scrubs that colonial era story about itself as a transplanted English phenomenon and in, tells instead um, in the 1790s the story of, um, of, of Indians sharing knowledge of the water um, with the colonists. You see the same thing in 1833 um, in Bath, Virginia. Um, uh, an 1833 history of Virginia uh, writes that tradition relates that these springs were known by the Indians as possessing valuable medicinal properties and were m much frequented by them. So again, we in fact have even renamed, or it's, it is no longer Bath, Virginia, it's now Berkeley Springs. They've renamed the town to get rid of the, um, uh, the uh, English name um, and created a, a sort of like strategically vague story about uh, Indians at some point telling white people that these waters were here, right, um, and that they were medicinally valuable. Um, you begin to see these stories um, spreading across um, northern, uh, other new northern des uh, destinations, um, particularly in the 1830s and the 1840s. Um, there's, a, there's a rapid growth in other small mineral springs towns um, around the northeast. Um, these smaller imitators, right, were often being driven by, by doctors and, and rural entrepreneurs who saw in one of these mineral springs destinations an opportunity to bring visitors and money um, to what were a lot of the time like still pretty remote corners um, of the country. So to give you an example, um, an 1834 uh, history and topography of the United States uh, talked about Avon Springs near Rochester, which is the the dot the pin that's already on the on the far west side of New York State, just south of Lake Ontario there. Um, and this this uh, history uh, um, celebrated Avon uh, Avon um, as a resort for the valetudinarian, i.e., someone seeking for health. Uh, the Avon Springs seem to have been partially known to the Seneca tribe of Indians. This account declared, particularly to the far famed chief. Uh, Red Jacket, who enumerated them among his remedial measures for the cure of disorders of the skin and wasting disorders as they were termed, right? Uh, this account really stands out to me because it actually names an Indian, 
right? <laughs> There's like an actual name there. Um, and in the 1830s, um, talking about Red Jacket, that's basically as close to a sort of celebrity endorsement as you can get, right? Red Jacket was, was a, uh, an indigenous leader that, that most Anglo-Americans would have known in the 1830s. So um, this, uh, this history and topography of the United States sort of slips in a kind of celebrity endorsement for, for, for Avon Springs um, with this reference to Red Jacket, right? Um, uh, another um, example that I want to talk about um, is, is a, uh, the, new, the so-called new and thriving village of Richfield Springs, which is the dot in the center there of, of New York State. Um, in 1856, a correspondent for Harper's um, visited this new and thriving resort um, where he narrated this incredibly elaborate legend of the Springs Indian stories. And I want to share this one with you, um, partly because it's totally over the top, um, and also to give you a sense of how elaborate these stories were getting by the middle decades um, of the 19th century. Um, this uh, Harper's correspondent wrote, hither the Mohawks came for the cure of frostbitten feet. And tradition says that a famous healing prophet once dwelt upon a beautiful island in the midst of Canadaraga Lake near Richfield Springs, uh, to whom invalids from all the Iroquois used to come and leave their maladies. This prophet used his secret knowledge of the springs to penetrate the dark forest to the fountains and then return to his patients with vessels full of magic waters. His knowledge of the springs eventually goes to his head in this story. And at last, he called himself the twin brother of the great spirit. Angered by the prophet's blasphemy, the great spirit in his wrath thrust the island with the proud prophet so deep into the earth that the waters of the lake where it stood are unfathomable by human measurement. Right? I looked for a long time for any um, uh, Iroquois story about that, that even vaguely resembled this story, and I cannot find any, right? This was entirely, as far as I can tell, fabricated from whole cloth by a Harper's correspondent um, with a literary bent, right? Um, but it has all the hallmarks of this blossoming genre in mid-century, right? It's full of these sort of masculine prophets, mystical Indian knowledge, um, sort of ham-handed references to the great spirit, Right? Um, and importantly, right, it takes pains to locate Richfield Springs' origins far away from the practices of fashionable Anglo-American uh, leisure, leisure, right? This story, um, um, as made up as it may be, certainly has the virtue of having absolutely nothing at all to do with European traditions um, of bathing, right? And so now I want to return to that question that I started with, right? Now that I've given you some of these examples, I want to explore three explanations, three pieces of cultural work that I think that these stories were doing. Um, three answers to that question of why. Why do we see these stories showing up um, all over the place um, in accounts of American leisure practices in the 19th century? The first explanation, I think, um, is that they helped early national Americans um, to borrow a very evocative phrase from the historian Carrie Ann Yakota, it helped them to, quote, unbecome British, right? I think that this is one of the most pressing uh, problems of national identity formation in the early years of the United States, right? Most of the fabric of daily life, right, from language and arts to laws and economic institutions was derived directly from the British Empire, right, of which they had so recently been the subjects, right? But as citizens of a newly independent nation, Many Americans felt a strong need to disentangle American culture from its British forebears, either by pushing it in new directions or, as I want to argue here, by reinventing alternative origin stories for American beliefs and practices that lay outside of their British um, origins. Um, Indians right, were a particularly useful cultural tool for this project. Right? Um, Americans and this is to borrow another phrase from the historian Phil Deloria, played Indian, right, to demonstrate their cultural difference from, as well as their cultural superiority to Britain. And the strategy is all over American culture um, in, the, in the 19th century, right? Um, think of politics, right? The Boston Tea Party, right, where the, where the um, protesters famously um, dressed as indigenous people, right? It's all over art. Think of George Catlin's romantic Indian paintings, right? And of course, it's all over literature, right? Think of um, James Fenimore Cooper's Leather Stocking Tales, right? Um, in the form of the, but in the form of the Indian spa origin story, um, I, wanna, I wanna suggest this, this strategy helped elite Americans differentiate uh, 
their leisure practices from their European um, antecedents. Speaking of Last of the Mohicans, um, a scene from that 1826 novel will illustrate this point for me, I think, right? Um, Cooper set the scene um, in Last of the Mohicans um, at a not yet developed Boston spot in 1757. So um, in this passage, a small party of Mohicans were able to outmaneuver their foes because they correctly predicted that they would be attracted to this well-known spring in a secluded dell. Um, the white frontiersmen companions were surprised at the fame of the spring um, in, in Cooper's story. Um, to which the Moho Mohican guide responds, uh, few redskins who travel south and east of the Great Lakes but have heard of its qualities. Will you taste it for yourself? Hayward, who um, the, character, the white character who in this novel um, sort of stands in as the, the first white man at the springs, um, threw, he said, threw the water aside with grimaces of discontent. But before leaving the spot, each of the foresters stooped and took a long and parting draught at that solitary and silent spring around which, and its sister fountains, within 50 years, the wealth, beauty, and talents of the hemisphere were to assemble in throngs in pursuit of health and pleasure. Now, it's like a typically Cooper-esque, like, incredibly tortured sentence. Um, uh, yeah. It's incredibly tortured sentence. But what he's trying to say, right, he's, he's foreshadowing for you that this scene that he sets um, in a secluded dell, right, um, where the Mohicans teach Hayward to drink this water, um, is Boston's Bob. And in case he doesn't make that sufficiently clear, by 1831, in new editions of the text, he actually puts in a footnote. Right, a little, a little asterisk or a little cross, depending on the on the uh, edition. A little footnote at the bottom of the page that uh, that informs readers that the scene was set quote on the spot where the village of Boston now stands, one of the two principal watering places of America. So, like, just in case you miss it while you're reading the book itself, Cooper gives you a footnote to be like, "Hey guys, this is the origin story of Boston Spa." Um, there's a little bit of a bittersweet note to this too. When you get to later editions of, of um, Last of the Mohicans, you know, by the end of the 19th century, there's a footnote to the footnote that says, yeah, but nobody goes there anymore, basically, right? Bolson Spa sort of falls on hard times in the second half of the 19th century. Um, so there's sort of a footnote to the footnote that's sort of like, yeah, 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 but nobody goes there anymore, which is sort of like a little bit of a bittersweet moment for, for Boston, right? Um, so you see in this, in this little moment, um, in Last of the Mohicans, this strategy, right, of, of saying whatever is happening now at Boston, right, the beauty and the fashion of the continent are assembled, are assembling, whatever is happening now at Boston is not at all what happened in England. It's something totally different, and it has its origin moments here, right, um, in this kind of almost ritualized um, uh, uh, passing over of the water. But at the same time that early National Americans were triangulating Britishness in this way. Um, they were also seeking to assert an organic and legitimate claim to the specific land stakes of the, the North American continent. So this is my second explanation here, that these stories did not merely serve to extricate uh, elite American leisure practices from their entanglement with arist their aristocratic British roots, but they also sought specifically to appropriate native landscapes and histories as part of Anglo-American landscape and history. And this is also right, is a common cultural strategy uh, amongst Anglo-Americans um, in the 19th century, right? That they, they thought to both absorb and erase Indians from the landscape and from the history. By I say erase, I mean um, literally push out, but also absorb, which is to take uh, Indian knowledges, Indian histories, and make them, in a sense, the prehistories of Anglo-America, right? They, they granted themselves these kinds of deeper histories um, of the continents in order, I think, really to obscure their own role in its conquest and to explain why natives were, quote unquote, disappearing as a part of its natural evolution, right? Um, indeed, and I'm uh, resting on the work of a lot of really important scholars here, like Shari Hundorf and Gene O'Brien and James Joseph Buss, um, that they pointed out, right, that this simultaneous absorption of native histories and denial of native persistence, right, insisting that native people are now in fact disappeared, right, denying the persistence of native claims to their land and their culture, I, in fact is precisely the point in these stories, right. Um, turning again right back to that scene in Last of the Mohicans with Hayward um, at, the, at the spring that would become Boston, right. Um, the story, Cooper really lingers on the substance of that communication 
from uh, when the Mohican guide is tutoring the first white man, quote unquote, in the drinking of the water, explaining, you want the flavor that one gets by habit. The time was when I liked it as little as yourself, but I have come to, but I have come to my taste, and now I crave it as the deer does the licks. Right. So this Mohican is willingly, in, in Cooper's story, is willingly sharing his knowledge of the land with the white settler. Right? And, um, and, and so there's, it's almost a sort of ritualized moment of transfer of knowledge uh, over the landscape um, to, um, to Anglo-Americans. Um, and then, of course, in all of these stories, um, F Cooper accomplishes it in that footnote I mentioned earlier. Right? Uh, the next chapter is, um, and then white people developed it and turned it into an important destination, right? So there's that's almost sort of like ritualized moment of handover of knowledge that I think serves um, sort of Anglo-American consumers of these stories as a way to make the continent their own and to make its history their own. The third explanation uh, I want to propose, right, is that these stories made specifically gendered claims that the American elite was a virtuous elite. You had to be pretty elite to go to these uh, Springs towns in the 19th century. You had to have money to get there. Uh, and more importantly, you had to have the leisure to spend the time. So these were quite elite spaces, most of them, um, in the 19th century. And of course, what uh, these elites actually did with their time um, at, in these spa towns is not really meaningfully all that different from what was happening at places like Bath in England, where a British elite is gathering and drinking water and staying in fancy hotels and going to lots of balls and attempting to marry off their marriageable daughters to uh, marriageable young men, right? It, it's very similar in terms of what people are actually doing um, at these spas. Um, so the, 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 um, these stories help the American elites tell themselves that what they're doing, whatever similarity it might have to what's happening um, in European spa cultures, is different um, and better, right? That it represented a morally pure concern for robust physical health rather than a morally suspect desire for leisure, fashion, and dissipation. Now, this was a distinction in 19th century American culture both in Britain and in, in the United States, that was powerfully gendered, was profoundly gendered, right? The demographic prominence and social power of women at fashionable resorts marked them as places where pretense and deception reigned, where opportunities for dissipation tempted, and where sexual immorality, immor immorality lurked. And there I'm quoting a historian named Cindy Aaron, who's written a lot about these, these spas. Right? In these narratives of danger, leisured women um, who are running the social environments of these spas, right, pose a threat to the sort of moral social order of, of the American elite, right? Um, so therefore, boosters and promoters of um, spa towns uh, work to produce alternative masculine narratives of Indian origins to distance those destina the destinations that they were promoting from those feminized, decadent, and corrupt European antecedents, right? Um, if you've noticed, all the stories I've, I've recounted so far, all of those Indian stories I've recounted so far, have involved entirely male protagonists, right? It's male Indians and male white settlers, right, who are encountering each other in the wilderness and who are engaged in this act of, of ritual knowledge transfer. And in each of those cases, right, the knowledge that's being transferred, the use that these, this entirely masculine uh, group of people uh, are making out of the springs is, is all about health, right? None of it is about leisure. None of it is about relaxing. None of it is about getting out of the city for the summer. None of it is about balls or concerts or casinos or horse races or marrying off your eligible daughters. It's always about healing from war and, and very sort of masculine things, right? So I think these Indian origin stories, right, are meant to to tell elite Americans visiting at these springs that no matter what you're actually doing um, with your time at the spa, right, you should understand it as a fun fundamentally masculine um, uh, sort of pursuit of health, right, rather than a problematic and dangerously feminized pursuit of leisure and decadence, right, um, and, and amusement. Um, somewhat ironically, right, um, the 
when, there are a handful of or places where women do pop up in these origin stories. And I think that, that these origin stories um, that include women um, really just serve to illustrate my point. Um, somewhat arbitrarily, um, the question of the geological origin of the High Rock Spring itself uh, became a topic of both gendered and racialized debate amongst the promoters of Saratoga Springs. Um, I don't, this is a postcard from 1907. And I don't know if you can see it, but basically the High Rock Spring is this interesting geological formation where there was a spring um, that was carrying a lot of the minerals in the water. That, that's why they come and drink it. Um, it had been flowing up. And as it had been flowing over, um, the, the minerals had been uh, sort of collecting and being deposited such that it was um, created this, this cone of a kind of rock-like substance. Uh, but at some point prior to the first Anglo-Americans visiting there, a, a crack had formed in this cone. So the water no longer came out of the top by the time uh, white people showed up. It was, it was emerged out of a crack at the bottom. Um, and the, the geological origins of this uh, phenomenon became a weird subject of gender debate. Um, so in uh, 1817, that, that early doctor um, that was doing scientific analyses of the Saratoga water, John Steele, right, uh, outlines competing theories of, of local residents and natural philosophers about why the high rock water um, had, had formerly flowed out of the top of the cone and now was out of the bottom, right? But in 1831, when he reprinted his pamphlet, he added an Indian origin story to the debate. He reported that, quote, an aged chief of the St. Regis tribe of Indians was told by the Indians that the water once ran over the top, but owing, as they supposed, to some of their women bathing in it when they ought not to have done so, the water sunk back into the rock and never showed itself again at the top, right? Now, Steele actually did hear this story from a St. Regis Mohawk. Um, most likely, and Steele would not, did not understand this, right? Most likely, um, it referred to a violation of a, of a menstrual taboo, which was a common feature of, of Northeastern indigenous societies. Women, when they were, um, uh, when they were menstruating, were, were supposed to be sort of socially uh, segregated from, from the rest of the community. Um, so, you know, if, if in fact this was a story that Steele, in fact, heard from a St. Regis Mohawk, probably that's what the guy was talking about, right? He was talking about a, some sort of violation of a menstrual t taboo. But Steele himself leaves it vague, right? And that, that's all he says about it. But this story um, gets developed later in the 19th century by other uh, guidebook authors and promoters. Um, particularly, um, I, I'm not going to make you read this whole poem. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, um, pretty gnarly poem. Um, but it's from an 1841 tourist guidebook, right? Um, and it's called The Indian Legend of the High Rock Spring. But basically, the gist of the story is that there's this rocky cone um, that lies far in the forest deep recesses, which was known to the fierce tenants of the woods for the spring of healing water. And it rose over the top, and it flowed down, flowed down the sides. Or at least it did until a, quote, female form of lovely mold came with love to revel there. When she went to bathe in the pure spring, the water recoiled because of the deep print, because deep printed on that beating heart forever to remain. In spite of tears and cleansing founts, there was a guilty stain. So the force of this pure water's disdain for the, quote, stained woman was so strong that it cracked the rock and forever flowed out of the bottom of the cone. Um, and at the end of the poem here, um, the native women, quote, fled uh, with desponding shame, nor was she ever heard of more, and none recalled her name. Right? Um, and I think this poem really laid bare Saratoga promoters' gendered anxiety about aristocratic decadence at the spring. Right? He injects this characteristically Eurocentric preoccupation with female virginity. Right? It's clear that the violation here um, is, that, is that, um, uh, that this Indian maiden had, had lost her virginity before marriage, right? um, so he, which is, has nothing to, right, uh, nothing to do with the uh, what I think were probably a, a story about a menstrual taboo, if it was in fact ever an indigenous uh, story about this this uh, phenomenon, right? Uh, but he he it, um, ooh, I, sorry, I hit that button. Um, but Sir Devoe, right? This this spring was pure, bright, and health giving until it was inappropriately used by this native mate maiden to cleanse the mortal stain, the moral stain of premarital sex, right? So I think in this story, you can see the ways in which these origin stories are posing a kind of gender dichotomy between, on the one hand, right, sort of feminine uses of the water, 
right, which are all about sort of decadence and pleasure and luxury are morally suspect. Um, and masculine uses of the water, which are supposed to be about health and, and wellness and, and, and healing after war. Um, and in this poem, right, suggests that the, that the water itself recoils from this sort of feminine gender decadence um, uh, that um, characterized it. All right. To end today, I got a few more minutes. And I want to talk a little bit about actual vacationers and actual Indians. Because I've been talking about narratives this whole time, right? I've been talking about stories that um, mostly either um, literary authors or uh, openly commercial promoters like guidebook authors were writing about these stories. So what of actual visitors to the spring? Interestingly, very few actual vacationers seem to uh, to reflect these stories, right? They're much, if you read what uh, letters and diaries from visitors to the spring say, they're much more interested in um, balls, marrying off marriageable daughters, parties, who's at what hotel, right? Um, they, they, they talk about these places um, as if, again, as if they are the New England bath, right, to borrow that old colonial phrase. Um, they don't seem to particularly absorb these Indian stories. Right? So I think that's actually really interesting, right? that, um, that, that as hard as these sort of um, literary and, and tourism entrepreneurs were pushing these stories as a kind of solution to a set of American cultural problems, actual tourists just don't seem that interested. And they're really interested in replicating what the Europeans are doing um, in, in their spa towns. That's not to say that visitors don't encounter Indians. They do, right? There are at the, the Springs towns are actually full of um, indigenous people at this time, right? Living native people, right? Notwithstanding these fantasies of disappearance, continue to inhabit the landscape, uh, to use the land and its resources, to make demand on the nation, to interact with white Americans in the context of work and leisure, right? Particularly after 1840, uh, native entrepreneurs traveled to summer resorts selling their crafts and entertaining visitors by demonstrating their, their way of life. The most famous was there was a permanent Indian encampment at Saratoga. But uh, native entrepreneurs also built perma a permanent presence at Niagara Falls um, and visited other resort towns on a more informal basis. And this is an engraving of the Indian encampment at Sharon Springs, which is another one of these small uh, springs destinations in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and in these communities, right, indigenous entrepreneurs came, they've lived, um, they produced uh, uh, artifacts and handicrafts for sale to, to tourists. Um, baskets in particular um, were very popular. Uh, sometimes they, uh, they performed dances and other kinds of cultural ceremonies for white audiences, again, for money, right? These people were, were, were fundamentally commercial leisure entrepreneurs um, uh, there. Um, Anglo-American spa promoters, this is, presents a real problem for them, right? Because they want to tell the story about Indians that's rooted in the deep past, that Indians had this mystical knowledge, they had this masculine use of the water, they handed it over to the, quote, first white man at the spring, and then they fade out of the picture. But of course, they're not faded out of the picture at all. They're right there selling moccasins and baskets and performing dances. So the question is, how do, how do, you have to, how do um, these promoters deal with it? Um, they manage this disruption by simultaneously denying the Indianness of the inhabitants of the, in, of the encampments and at the same time accusing them of commercialism. So one 1867 guidebook that I found described the Indians of the encampment as, quote, not to be mistaken for the old warrior age of aboriginal story, nor for the interesting gentry of that stripe who figure in poetry and fiction. On the contrary, they are the very opposite and degenerate class, being simply a gypsy band, half quarter breeds of Canadian French and Negro blood with plenty of the vicious reality but little of the beautiful romance of the conventional Indian character. Not only were they racially degraded um, in these accounts, right? these red men visit the place not as they follow the war path, nor in quest of game, nor even to drink the waters and be healed, as did their forefathers sometimes in ages gone by, but simply with an eye to business. Right? I just want to rest for a moment in the profound irony of a guidebook author, right? Someone who is building one of the biggest commercial leisure industries of the 19th century um, in these spa towns, accusing the Indians of crass commercialness, right? Let's just sit with that for a moment, right? With the, with the irony of that, right? But I actually think it's important, right? Uh, um, 
uh, anxious as they were about the social and cultural implications of elite commercialized leisure at the Springs uh, that they themselves were promoting, right? They rewrote that anxiety onto the bottom, onto the bodies of modern natives while continuing to claim the imagined practices of long dead natives as their own forerunners, right? What you see here is these white entrepreneurs saying, no, we are the true inheritors of the ancient indigenous knowledge and these other people are not really Indians. Or if they are Indians, they're too commercial. Right? So you can see that real sleight of hand in those stories there, um, where they are um, uh, trying to take on for themselves right, the mantle of the continent um, and its history. Right? After the Civil War, right, these stories got even more elaborate. Think back to um, William Johnson. Right? Um, they go national, something I didn't have a chance to talk about much tonight, um, and, I, and I'm running low on time. Um, is, is the way in which these stories were, were, before the Civil War, very much specifically a Northeastern phenomenon. But after the Civil War, you see Southern Mineral Springs resorts beginning to invent their own Indian origin stories. And you even see these stories emerging in much uh, more raw and kind of contested ways in the West, um, particularly as um, Indian removal in the far West was taking place to make room for national parks. Right? Um, that what you see is, is uh, white conservationists pushing um, a, a sort of perverse version of the Indian origin stories in order to, to justify removal for, for park creation. Um, but basically, by the turn of the 20th century, these stories had really entered, um, had entered the uh, uh, sort of conventional wisdom. And I just want to end in this last moment here with a quote from a, from a 1917 historian of medicine um, named Felix von Ophel, and he's, he's a guy who's writing about the history of, of American medicine in the 19th century. Um, and he declared flatly in 1917 that the American mineral springs used by the settlers were originally mineral springs learned from the aboriginal Indians. Uh, citing examples from across the continental United States, he felt comfortable asserting that even though, he said, even though we have no individual records, we are able to abstract from imaginary stories of the literature. He argued that the Caucasian settlers learned from the red men of the existence of remarkable mineral springs because every settler tried to make a fortune in different directions. Some of them expected to get rich obtaining the property of a powerful mineral springs. Indeed, the only uh, identifiable piece of evidence that this supposed scholar and historian of medicine presented was um, included, quote, the poem Hiawatha of Longfellow and Washington Irving's sketchbook. I just want to leave you there how by the turn of the 20th century, even supposedly serious historians were looking to um, Longfellow um, and Irving to assert the truth of this origin story, um, not in the absence of evidence, but I would argue despite the absence of evidence. So actual visits to the Springs show wide variations in their responses, right? Um, but uh, but this, this um, Indian origin story, right, does really important cultural work for the uh, American elite in the 19th century. It disentangles them from the British. It allows them to claim uh, the continent and its history um, from indigenous peoples and allows them to get on the correctly gendered side right, of moral uses of leisure. And with that, uh, let's take some questions. Perfect. Thank you so Thank you. much. That was fantastic. Um, so happy to take questions. If you're here physically, just raise your hand and just wait until I get the microphone to you so our at-home audience can hear. Uh, are there any questions here in the audience that are with us? I know we have a couple online. Question? Oh, hold on. Let me get you the mic. One of the things that uh, occurred to me in your presentation is, is the power of myth. And I think that is one of the reasons why these, these stories have developed and continue to have a life of their own. W would you care to comment? Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. Um, but I think that I would not, um, I don't think that I would chalk that up to some abstract eternal power that myth has. I think you are correct about that. But I think what's interesting about these and important about these stories, right, is that they are myths that serve very concrete cultural and commercial purposes, right? So these aren't myths that are just sort of like free floating in the world. They are myths that are being 
developed and told by very particular identifiable people with what seemed to me very particular and ad identifiable kind of cultural and commercial um, uh, uh, agendas, right? So yeah, they are absolutely myths, right? Um, but they are myths that I think don't, they don't um, spread through American culture through their own, their own force and power, right? They are propelled um, by an emerging culture industry. Yeah, for sure. Any other questions from our audience here? Okay, we have one back here. Thank you so much for this. Well, this was really interesting, this kind of post-colonial um, story. And I appreciate the framing uh, that way. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering, you sort of gestured at this a bit, but I'm wondering, especially in the mid-19th century, we've talked about these as, as spaces for health, for men, um, is there also a sense, especially as there becomes some controversy at mid-century about the feminizing aspects of culture and the city, is there a sense of these spaces as uh, remaining distinct from water cure spaces as places to restore masculinity or even as a newspaper might code it, vitality? Mm -hmm. um, all of that kind of stuff. When, when there isn't an, a war you can pretend to be rehabbing from um, and the, the popping up after the Civil War in the South seems to gesture that that idea is still there. But in the mid-century, um, does it kind of take on a different cast? No, because I don't think any of the Anglo-American men who are resorting to these places, like short of William Johnson, are like actually healing war wounds, right? It's, this is more that the story is that this water emerges out of this, knowledge of this water emerges out of a sort of um, sort of a mystical Indian brave knowledge of warfare and healing, and it gets transferred often in these moments of war, like in the French and Indian War in these stories. Um, but yeah, no, these guys are all like, these guys are all sort of like mid-level merchants, right, who um, want to get out of the heat of the summer, right? And certainly, what you're gesturing towards is towards the middle and especially at the end of the 19th century, right, an increasing um, uh, concern about nervous exhaustion in men, right? So yeah, no, these men are like, you know, the, the sort of, they are taking the, the mystical knowledge of the braves of the war path and using it to sort of like heal jangled nerves from the, from the accounting house. Um, yeah, and, and you know, the, the question of the sort of the gendering of that space, that is an ongoing thing throughout the 19th century. Um, and that is partly reflects the demographics of these spaces, which is that to say that many elite families um, would go and spend long periods of time, the wife and children would go and spend a long period of time there, um, and the, and the uh, husbands would come and go, right, according to the, to the needs of, of their employment. Um, you know, these are particularly sort of like elite professional and businessmen. Um, so these spaces were actually, right, in the sort of day-to-day -day social life, right, uh, very female dominated. But again, like I said, this is a real source of anxiety for a lot of American elites because of the association of, of uh, feminization and aristocrat aristocracy and decadence and Britishness, right? Um, and and so that's why I think that these stories really serve to erase that, right? And again, like I said a moment ago, when, when women do pop up in these stories, they do in these incredibly problematic ways, right? These sort of like fallen Indian squaws and that kind of thing. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Oh, yes. Coming down with the mic. All right. fast forward today to do these mineral springs still exist or just um, trickles or has so much been built up around them that no they mostly still exist what uh, are they used for now uh, tourism right yeah <laughs> I, I don't think most visitors to the I, I, let me say a lot of these places um, were um, sort of small uh, uh, profoundly entrepreneurial in the sense it was often like a small, like a small local elite or, or local landlord or lo local landowner or something like that who saw an opportunity. So a lot of them were sort of ephemeral. I pulled up this picture of Richfield Springs, right, to give you a sense of if you go to there is a town now called Richfield Springs. You would be hard pressed to find any trace of this era in its history, right? Um, uh, 
if I go forward here to Sharon Springs, right, um, there's a couple of like falling down hotels, right, moldering in the woods. Um, but if you go to a place like Saratoga or go to a place like White Sulphur, right, the, the springs are still there, right, um, and they're often kind of preserved as part of a historic landscape. And you can, you can absolutely go and drink the water, right, and it's pretty gross, but you can, I mean, it doesn't taste good, right? But um, um, yeah, you could totally still do it. And so now it's like people do it as sort of like a, like a lark. Right? But I think it's often framed in the context of a sort of historical tourism now. You know, go see these places that were once fancy um, and, and you know, sort of live as they lived for a moment. Right? But yeah, you can, go to, you can absolutely go to the Saratoga and see the High Rock Spring and dip a little bit of water out of it and drink it for sure. Yeah. Okay, we have an online question. Is there a bridge between ethnographic display at World's Fairs and indigenous entrepreneurs you mentioned? Are there historians who link displays at baths to later commercial authentic displays? Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't know that I would, I would certainly put the Indian encampments of the 1840s in the same kind of long-term cultural trajectory as for example, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show right, um, in the late 19th century. Um, and that whole sort of, um, uh, uh, all the imitators he spawned, right? And if you look at the World's Fairs that are happening uh, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, you know, sort of from the um, 1870s through the, through the 1930s, right? There were often uh, sort of sideshow uh, type spaces that were associated with, with the World's Fairs that included, um, uh, entertainments that look like Buffalo Bill's Wild West shows, right? So I think that there's actually a really long uh, tradition of indigenous entrepreneurs um, what, doing what you might think of as, as, as making uh, lemonade out of lemons, right? Which is taking um, these sort of generally white produced narratives about Indians and who they are um, and how they behave and how they're disappearing and turning those into forms of commercialized culture that they can then turn around and sell back to white people for a profit, right? Um, so yeah, I would absolutely put the Indian encampments of the 1840s in that long, um, in that long cultural trajectory. And that, you know, particularly the, the, the culture industry infrastructure doesn't exist for something like Buffalo Bill's Wild West show yet in the 1840s, right? If you want to find white people who are hanging out and have money and a good time and are looking to spend it on recreation, um, this is precisely the play, kind of place you would go, right? So th that's why I think it's sort of in that long trajectory. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for Will, both online or in person? All right, well, Will, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you all for coming out on a, on a rainy night here in Hartford. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.